What's happening, everyone? Before this next Lego podcast show starts, this is a reminder to you not to be a minge bag. Go over to Patreon, sign up for a pound a week, and take advantage of all the Patreon perks. It is the Patreon that pays. We have a betting show on a Saturday, which the postman here is picking winners every single week. Yeah, the betting show comes out Saturday mornings, covers UFC and boxing, footy when we're um, within the footy season. But yeah, we're winning on a weekly basis. I can't remember the last week we didn't find some sort of winner. So yeah, as Andy says, don't be a minge bag, come and get involved. And as I say, it's one of the best communities that you could be a part of, isn't it? It's a belter. As well as the betting show on a Wednesday, me and George have a chat. That's where you might have seen on our Insta reels about Crocs, about harpooning people at the end of the night, all that kind of chat that goes on. And even better, every single Wednesday, we do a raffle draw and our sponsors, Montrex, give a hundred pound gift voucher away just for being on Patreon. No better time to join. There's 30 plus episodes already that you can go back and watch. Again, no better time. Get involved. Don't be a minge bag. Pound a week and we'll see you there. Welcome to the Lego Podcast. It's me, Jordan Neald. It's me, Andy Grant. And this week's guest is Frank McKenna. Hi, Hi, Andy. Good to see you. Yeah. Hi, mate. All right. (laughs) Uh, Before we kick off, big shout out again. Uh, Our sponsors, Montrex. Uh, Check in the video and the description for the discount code this month. Also, if you want to be involved in winning a £100 Montrex gift voucher, all you've got to do is sign up to Patreon. It's a pound a week. You get loads of extra perks. The betting show with the postman. (laughs) All kinds going on over there. Uh, Get involved. Also, their clothing, 20% off them if you type in Legger20. And also Health Kick Kitchen. Big shout out to them. All the descriptions and links are in the bio. Done. Hi, right, Frank. <laughs> Very professional, that, Andy. Oh, I've been doing that for a while, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, to be honest, mate, I've been looking forward. Obviously, I went on your podcast uh, during lockdown, yeah. which seems a while ago yeah, now. Yeah. But you're someone, mate, I've been really keen to talk to because um, I don't know, I feel like you're, you're in the know with most things going on in the city, both politically uh, and business wise. and I just think you're a, you're a cool fella to kind of speak to and <laughs> I'm, I'm being serious to kind of get your views on things but I also want to know if that's right with you where it all come from because yeah, I think sure. this kind of era that we're in at the moment with politics I can't say I'm, I'm massive on politics at any point in my life but I just think from the outside it just seems we're at a real low point yeah. in politics at the moment obviously you've dabbled in that you know a lot what's going on with politics and business so if it's all right with you just wanted the chat to be around that no doubt i'll give you some shit about your football team and your support as well (laughs) but um if that's all right with you mate yeah yeah absolutely so so where's talk to me about growing up for you then and how kind of you kind of got into politics and yeah um i think a fairly unusual story in one sense i mean i was born in bootle um so whereabouts uh just behind the strand so i was born in a house somewhere around there um and uh lived in bootle until i was seven uh, we ended up in the flats opposite the Mons. Uh, so <laughs> that's where, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's where we were living, and uh, and they that was quite a luxurious place for us to move to because prior to that we'd been in a prefab uh, just on the corner of a place which was demolished uh, by the Mons. So not the most uh, <laughs> not the most privileged of upbringings, you might yeah. say. Although having said that, my dad was a bus driver, mum you know sort of dabbled part-time work mostly housewife um and gave me a fantastic um upbringing so you, you know wouldn't swap it for the world uh but nonetheless it wasn't sort of the background that you'd expect eventually somebody would go into uh, the world of politics that being said my dad w- was always very politically interested a uh, big labor supporter and uh was a shop steward so we, from Bootle, moved to um, Scalmers there. Uh, Newtown, at the time, built to deal with the overspill of Liverpool. Likes of Kirby, Runcorn, likewise. Um, so really, uh, from the age of seven, eight, um, I was a Skemmer. <laughs> so I was brought up in Skem. And again, town has got a, a, a poor reputation, for obvious reasons, one of the most deprived places uh, in the country, high levels of unemployment it's always suffered, particularly uh, youth unemployment. It is fairly isolated uh, as a town, largely because it hasn't got a railway station, so its connectivity is really poor. That is sort of its reputation, as I say, but if you've grown up in a place um, and you had the good education that I had, particularly at primary level, but even the secondary school, St Richard's, wasn't as bad 
as some people would like to make you believe, uh, then I actually think it was good grounding um, for, for, for my future. And as I say, alongside that half decent education at least, um, was a, a dad who, as I say, was quite politically interested and active. And I just naturally fell into that, I suppose. You know, I always watched the news, even when I was a kid growing up. I remember Thatcher's election and my dad being absolutely despondent uh, in 1979. It's, it's funny, isn't it, how political? I remember I went to Glastonbury last week and guys at Glastonbury were talking about, they remember where they where they were at Glastonbury when the um, Brexit yeah. elections come yeah, through. So there's always, yeah. I think, certain yeah. political times when you remember where you were and yeah. no doubt Thatcher coming in was one of them. Yeah, I remember my dad coming in from work and saying, well, that's the working class fucked, <laughs> yeah. basically yeah. said, and proved to be the case. Um, and so by the time we got to sort of 1980, um, so first year of Thatcher's government, I'd just gone to college then and was started to, to sort of dabble in, in student politics. Um, but I think if you look back to that period, you know, if you look at Liverpool, for example, militant was on the rise, as often happens when you have extreme governments on one side, you get extreme oppositions emerging on the other. Uh, and again, probably partly to do with my dad's influence, but I think also just because of the way I thought about politics. I didn't think that extreme left position was the way to go. I was a great admirer of Tony Benn, seen him speak on a number of platforms, thought he made an awful lot of sense. But equally, you know, I used to speak to people who were part of the Workers' Revolutionary Party, the SWP, the militant tendency, and it just sounded to me as though they were on a different planet. Mm. And as much as you may be able to take one or two of the things that they were saying and think, actually, I can sort of get that. When you look at the strategy and the overall position that they took, then actually it just wasn't mm. realistic. Uh, and for me, being in politics is about having power. To have power, you've got to win. And those sort of arguments and principles, even if you think they are 100% right, they're never gonna mm. win the majority of people in this country. So even at a very young age, sort of 16, 17, I was quite pragmatic about my politics. Uh, and by the time I was 19, 20, I think that was getting to the 83 election. Michael Foote was leader of the Labour Party then. So I joined the party, joined the party when I was 16, 17. Um, being sort of knocking around the branches, doing some activity, like sort of delivering leaflets, all that sort of thing, but really got involved in the, the 83 election. And again, what drove home to me, the, the idea that you've got to be pragmatic in terms of your political approach, was I was knocking on doors in Skem, Skem, and people were saying to me, as if I'm gonna vote Labour. Mm. Michael Foot, your leader, you want to give up our nuclear arms, and at that time, this will make you laugh, you want to leave Europe, <laughs> because that was Labour's policy in 83, and it was seen as nuts, mm. and it was nuts then, and it's nuts now. So, you know, I came away from the election in 83, even more convinced that actually you've got to have a pragmatic programme to win support of people. We can all sit on the sidelines and be principled, and say, oh, isn't Keir Starmer terrible yesterday saying we wouldn't rejoin the EU? Isn't it awful that the Labour Party abandoned its policy of unilateral nuclear disarmament? Isn't it terrible that we're not supporting the strikes 100%? But you've got to accept that if you want to be elected Prime Minister of this country, you've got to suck up some of these mm. things. We don't know what Keir Starmer thinks about the strikes in reality. We know really what he thinks about Brexit. But equally, we know that he's serious about becoming Prime Minister. So as I say, I learned that lesson back in 1983. And from then on in, I was probably somebody that would be described as right wing in the Labour Party. I've never thought of myself as that, but that's the way people will perceive the way I operate in politics. Because as I say, my priority as a Labour politician was always to win. Mm -hmm. Sort of fast forward a few years and- um, Sorry, trying to interject there. Yeah, what, yeah. Um, what is that like a, a paid role and what are you doing kind of work wise? No, not stuff? at I all. Mean, I mean, that, I mean, it's a good point actually, Andy, because I think, you know, to understand why I got involved as elected politician, I should just talk briefly about, you know, what I do as sort of my paid work. So again, if you go back to that period, uh, 83, it was time of, you know, boys from the black stuff, 
Um, people were very politicised, by the way, far more so than now, I think. Yeah, I always think that speaking to... to yeah, guys, very, then. very much. You know, you can talk to anyone and everyone has an, a, a political opinion. Yeah. Um, so I ended up doing some voluntary work in an unemployed centre in Skem. Uh, so welfare rights advice um, and there was uh, it was a very complex and complicated system it's not easy now but then you had unemployment benefits means tested non means tested disability there was all sorts going on with the benefit system and Thatcher was ripping it up and starting again almost so if you knew your way around that then you were you, know, you were sought after in terms of being an advisor. Mm. So I did that in Skem for, for about 12 months, as I say, voluntary. And then obviously, you know, it, it comes to, to pass that you've got to go and earn some money. I had a, by this time, I had uh, a couple of kids. And um, so a job came up in Leicester as a senior welfare rights officer. Uh, there weren't many people who knew the benefit system the way I did at that time. Went off for the interview, got the job, moved to Leicester um, so I was doing welfare rights advice and what we used to do was used to take what we called the benefits bus so it was a double decker bus and we'd go out in this bus every morning park it in the middle of one of the most deprived estates in Leicester and there were a lot of them at the time and we had the uh, bus converted into three officers and uh, honestly Andy we, we broke up at about half eight by nine o'clock there were about 30 40 people queuing and right till the end of the day. We'd often be there till five, six, seven o'clock at night, just seeing people going through the, the benefits entitlements mm. and what we, what we could get a little bit extra. And so I did that for about nine, 10 months. It was tough because A, a you're living in a place that you don't really know anyone. Mm. It, I mean, it's massively alien to, to Leicester and Liverpool, you know, or Leicester and Skem. Yeah. Very, very different places. None of our family around us, young, couple of kids as I say so difficult anyway but the other thing that I found increasingly was that it's quite frustrating because you'd see people get their initial sort of uplifting benefit which was great but you knew instinctively that after a few weeks that wasn't even touching the sides because like all of us once you earn a particular amount of money you, you spend it don't you um, so I was thinking to myself there's you know there's got to be more that you can do to make a difference that you know this is okay but actually you're not doing uh, as much as you could and there was something emerging at the time mostly from the states called community development community work which was basically trying to empower people themselves to create cooperatives to set their own businesses up to start social enterprises that sort of stuff but also to give people a voice through tenants associations and, and, and so on so I started to look into that as an opportunity and the first job that became available was was in North Wales in Deeside for uh, Clewer County Council so worked there for about 12, 12 months or so it was a temporary contract and then almost like my dream job came up which was community development officer for Skelmers there so I was able to go back to the town that I absolutely loved and still do uh, and start to make a difference there and, and did loads of stuff uh, in SCEM uh, for two or three years uh, in that position before uh, an opportunity then became available uh, to go and do the same sort of stuff but bigger scale in St. Helens, a uh, team of about 10 um, that, that I was sort of half managing and got embroiled in that. By the time I got to 26, um, I was noticing the fact that in St. Helens, as in Skelmersdale, every time you want to do something, you've got to go and ask a politician. So I thought, you know, this, this is pissing me off. Every time we want to have a conversation about whether it be rent, rates, whether it be helping people with electricity bills, changing legislation to help social enterprises, I've got to go and ask a politician. I may as well go and become a politician. And so that's how I ended up. Uh, running for office and, and by this time I've been in the Labour Party as I say from 16, 17 I've worked uh, on a number of elections uh, local elections, a general election in 83 I was running um, the constituency Labour Party I think by this time and w was fairly well regarded but the age is against you 
Um, the average age of a councillor at the moment is 66. I think oh. it was probably around the same then, to mm. be honest with you. He's probably a bit younger then, but not much. Well, it's just looked upon as if you've not got enough life experience almost. I think so. And also, you know, a lot of young people, at 26, you know, again, if, if I was doing it all over again, would I be standing for council or would I be going and queuing up for the Hacienda with me mate Tony Wilson? Probably <laughs> the latter, to be honest. But at that time, you know, it, it's, it's suggested to me that, as I say, given what I was doing, given the fact that my ambition was to make a difference, then the inevitable next step for me really was to go mm. into into elected politics. So because we were in Skelmersdale, and again, I think this is where a little bit of luck can can help at times. That's part of Lancashire, not Merseyside, even though we all talk like this. <laughs> and I ended up getting elected to Lancashire County Council, which was at that time the biggest local authority in the country. And the leader was a woman called Louise Elman. Now Louise, ended up becoming MP for Riverside here in Liverpool. But at that time was a fellow councillor in Skelmersdale. So what that meant was, leader of the council knew me quite well, well, knew me very well. And I was almost fast-tracked into um, what I would describe as quite high profile uh, positions with a little bit of responsibility. And I ended up chairing something called the Welfare Rights uh, Committee, which basically was established to take what we've been doing in Leicester for a number of years into the county, right across Lancashire. And I sort of managed that programme. So that was really exciting. Again, you feel as though you're doing something that's making a, a big difference for people. But wider than that, I sat on the Education Committee on Social Services, on Police. So you're getting an awful lot of intelligence and learning at a very young age. Mm. Um, and, you know, when I first walked into county, it's a very grand building. It's like a mini parliament almost, massive um, sort of uh, grounds that they've got the county. And uh, people always used to say to me, have you got imposter syndrome? And honestly, I absolutely didn't. I just took to it like a duck to water. I loved debating. I loved having arguments with the Tories and it's very combative. It's like parliament, the way it's set up. Um, and, and as I say, I, I absolutely fell in love with the place, thought this, this is great, this. Um, so was on the county council, um, ended up um, in 92 being an agent in West Lancashire for the parliamentary candidate. So it was a Tory seat, West Lancs, with a majority of about four or 5,000. So in 92, you remember that was Kinnock's second attempt at winning uh, a general election. We thought at one stage we might do it, but reality was that it was probably a step too far. We were still miles behind. You know, you know when you, it comes like that elections and, and you do fall short, is the, is the you know a real kind of falling off the cliff? You're thinking, oh, can hell, you know, got to start again, or was it? I think because Kinnick had done a lot to transform the party internally, um, people felt as though not as depressed. And I think that the other consolation for me was we won West Lancashire, which was a surprise to people with mm. a massive swing as well. So we won it fairly comfortably. Um, and that was because, in, in no small part, the, the campaign had been organised in exactly the way I said it should be organised. Um, so I got a bit of a reputation on the back of that, being a good organiser and a good thinker about the way in which you tackle campaign. It wasn't rocket science. I mean, basically what I'd said was, you know, we used to fight these election campaigns across West Lancashire, which is a very mixed constituency, as you can imagine, a lot of rural places, but then three towns, Ormsgate, Bersco and Skem. And we used to spread our meagre resources right across the whole district. And so your turnout in Skelmersdale at general elections was about 55, 60%. I said, we get that up to 70, 75, we win the seat. So all we did was we just targeted Skem and battered mm. it and got that sort of turnout. That seat now, is one of the safest Labour seats in the country because yeah. they've just followed that yeah. pattern and kept working it. Yeah. And we tr and we managed to uh, change the boundaries at some stage to make it a bit safer as well. So there was a bit mixed feelings for me. So we had, as I say, we won the election locally, so we had a Labour MP, that was important. Uh, and we've made enough gains for me to think, well, we can win next time in 90, I thought it'd be 96, subsequently it was 97. And this was when John Smith became leader of the party. So it was before Blair's time. So then I'm working as a parliamentary assistant and I'm a county councillor, so I'm a full-time politician. Everything I'm doing now is about politics. 
Uh, I'm working in Parliament for a time. I'm seeing what's happening in the House of Commons. Again, you're learning quite a bit in terms of procedures, the way things work. Um, you're starting to understand and appreciate that not all Tories have got horns. <laughs> and actually, behind the scenes, there's an awful lot of collaboration taking place. Uh, between Labour MPs, Liberal Democrat, because most of 99% of the legislation that we live under is just worked through in collective groups of Tories, Labour, Lib Dems, and so on. So you sort of see all that as well, and you start becoming a bit more a bit more mature, I think, in terms mm -hmm. of your approach to the opposition. And as I say, recognising they've not all got horns. Uh, and then by '95. Um, Louise had decided that she was going to move on, uh, go into Parliament, um, and she was the first one who phoned me and said, "Look, I'm I'm off to the Commons. Um, you've basically been groomed to to take my place. Um, not necessarily the right place for you to be leader straight away." There was another really experienced guy called John West who was brilliant on the finance and the detail side uh, of the way the council worked, which I absolutely never was um, so John is going to be leader uh, but we'd like you to run for, for deputy so I ran for that it was it was contested um, but I won that contest fairly comfortably uh, and again you know when I reflect on that at the time I didn't think it was any big deal but you think I think it was thir what would he have been then 32 I think uh, maybe a bit older um, but you I was the only scouser mm. in, in the council chamber. Uh, so you've got all these people who are sort of average age 55. And now I think, how did, how did I manage to persuade mm. that group mm. of councillors to, to elect me? But anyway, they did. Um, and, you know, during that period, um, I became chairman of something called Lancashire Enterprises, which was the economic development company that the county council ran. Ended up selling that for hundreds of millions of pounds to a private sector investor. Um, but that gave me a bit of an interest and insight into business as well. Mm. So that was that was a great role for me to have. Then became leader of the Northwest Regional Assembly. So all the leaders from the Northwest, like Sir Richard Lee, it was Frank Prendergast, I think, in Liverpool at the time. And then all those chief executives, including Howard Bernstein. I was leading that for them. Uh, and that was seen at the time as a bit of a precursor to a Northwest Parliament. So that was a really exciting role. Did an awful lot around uh, the European Commission and Brussels. We had as Lancashire County Council an office in Brussels. Mm -hmm. So used to go there at least once a month, talking to European politicians. Again, massive education for me. Um, and so by the end of that sort of 12 years, um, John was coming to retirement. I was then, uh, elected as leader of the county council so that would have been around 2001 i think um but what had happened in 1997 was that i'd been election agent again in west lancashire and you've got a spending limit on what you can basically utilize for an election campaign now listen it was a safe seat we were 10,000 majority we were heading for a landslide victory we didn't have to spend a penny in West Lancashire to win that seat. And I knew that I wasn't stupid. However, um, two years into, two years past the 97 election, so about 99, um, rumours started to appear in Private Eye magazine that we'd overspent on that election campaign. And the rumours had been started by members of the Labour Party <laughs> because I'd made a name for myself as being new Labour, um, sort of sharp elbows, got rid of a few people who I thought needed to get rid of, uh, old stages who were what I would describe as no better than boat and fodder, didn't do anything in the wards that they were representing, didn't, in my opinion, represent the Labour Party in the way in which it, were, it needed to be represented. The old guard, I suppose I'd describe it that. Uh, and so I'd sort of gone to war with them over a period of four years. And they saw this as an opportunity of doing me in. So went down to the Labour Party in Millbank, um, Deputy General Secretary, who's now the General Secretary, a guy called David Evans. Never forget what he said to me. Oh, don't worry about that. That's a load of crap. 
you know, there's loads of these complaints get made, not usually by your own <laughs> comrades, yeah. usually by the opposition. But it's past time anyway. The time limit only that complaint is a year. We're two years in. It'll be fine. So I sort of parked that, even though Private Eye ran the story about 60 times. And that's no exaggeration. Just kept appearing every couple of weeks. It was like, why, why do they keep pursuing this? Then obviously you get a little bit of interest from the local papers and that sort of thing. But by and large, I was able to put that at the back of my head, as I say, continue to progress with the political career. And I don't, I don't use that term with, with, with any excuse attached to it because if, if you're in politics, in my opinion, you should be in it seriously and it should be your career. So I've, I've no problem with people yeah. saying I've got a political career. Do you know at that point, sorry to put in, is your ambition to reach the top of politics in terms of like... It depends what you call the top. Yeah, but I mean, obviously Prime Minister's one yeah. that everyone wants to do, but is it to, like, what I'm thinking is, is everything you're doing because you believe it to be the right thing or is everything you're doing because you want to reach the top of what you consider the top of politics? You've, you've got to answer that honestly, I think, and it's a bit of both. Uh, because again, if you go back to when I was a welfare rights officer, I wasn't thinking about being mm. prime minister to make the biggest difference I could make, but I was thinking, what can I do next to make more of a difference? Mm. So I think once you're immersed in the in into the political machine, you're always thinking, well, what if I had the next position? How much more of a difference could I make? Uh, but if I'm honest. You know the the ideal and dream job for me was to be prime minister for the northwest, mm. which was a distinct possibility around that time because John Prescott had come up with these devolution deals. We had a Welsh assembly, we had a Scottish assembly, and the idea was create that sort of system in the northwest, the northeast, the Midlands, so on and so forth. That would have been for me my ideal job. Parliament, because I'd seen what happens in Parliament, because it's such a tough job. Uh, being an MP, you know, you, you're away from your family, you're away from your mates. Unless you're in the cabinet, you've not really got that much power and influence anyway. Um, and it's a seven day, 24 seven job really, because when you come out, you've got advice surgeries, you've got people pecking your head as far as that's concerned. Not fantastic money either. So that didn't really appeal to me, but being the prime minister of the region, you know, that what a fantastic, job that would have been you know six million people i think that is that you'd be, you'd be governing so that was me my ambition um but as i say it all come crashing down because that complaint eventually did work its way through to uh the police and then one sunny morning um when we just moved into a new house actually in up holland uh dawn raid <laughs> on the house really and uh, oh yeah yeah the full whack wow um so dawn raid police come in tipped the whole house upside down uh, I'd, by this stage I think there was three kids um, who were sort of under 16 you know okay. living in the house so we had all that and um, you know at that point you're thinking I can't believe David Evans said this wasn't going anywhere that, <laughs> that for over overspending did you say like yeah, yeah. overspend um, that's a bit over the top isn't it well it is but Within the, the you know what you've got to recognise here, and I'll never be able to prove this, but there were bigger forces at play. You know, I'd just been elected as leader of the regional assembly at that point, or was about to be elected as leader of the regional assembly. Uh, it was obvious that I was going to become leader of the county council. I was quite close to some people in Blair's cabinet, so we were, we were influ I was influential as, as a personality, and I put an awful lot of people's noses out of joint. So, you know, whether there were three, I've been told Masons were involved, I've been told there were police in the background that were involved, I was told the leader of the Labour Party at the time in West Lancashire, well, he was definitely involved, his fingerprints were all over the complaints. Um, but you're never going to be able to prove that there was a conspiracy. But it was, I mean, it, what a stupid thing mm. to be dawn raids and, and, you know, ultimately we find out they've spent three million pounds on the investigation, all that sort of thing. But um, because the party thought it was nonsense and it was nonsense um i wasn't suspended i was allowed to carry on and it was only when my leadership of the county council was confirmed about 48 hours after that decision was made i get a phone call from the police to say 
Crown Prosecution Service have decided to take this to court. So that was about 2001, as I said. And then the Labour Party really do have a serious problem because you've got a court case to fight. Mm. And do they want somebody as high profile as I was at the time in politics to be representing them? And, and it was different back in 2001 to what it is now. There was actually integrity in politics. <laughs> and, uh, and so, you know, the phone call, which is a tough one for me to take, and it, I'm not saying I didn't try and push back because I did, uh, but the party said, you're gonna have to stand down. So my position then was, uh, I'm a full-time politician. All of my income was derived from my position as a councillor. Um, and literally one day that's my job the next day it's like being made redundant but with no redundancy pay because again the thing is with yeah. politicians is there's no package of mm. well here you go here's some compo for you know so yeah that's uh that how, was how my political long... career crashed and burned what are you like with in charge of the crown uh, crown prosecution stuff what are you charged with like why did he take you to conspiracy court? to defraud the electorate Oh, okay. of West Lancashire. Now again, the charge itself was a bit difficult because as soon as you see the word fraud, mm. people think, ah, you've, you've had your fingers in the till. And, and there was nothing, there was, there was absolutely no uh, suggestion that I'd had any financial benefit, which yeah. made that whole thing a bit more bizarre, yeah. But the reason they were able to, to get me in the end was a, a mate of mine, John Phyllis, had been what we called a sub-agent and he'd signed one of the forms. I can't even remember how John got embroiled in this, but they needed a conspiracy charge with another person other than the MP because they didn't want to do the MP in because the MP, a guy called Colin Pickthor, was not their target. Colin Pickthor actually was private parliamentary secretary to the home secretary at the time, Jack Straw. So they'd been very clever in basically being t being able to create a charge that kept the MP out of it, embroiled me and brought this lad in who was on the periphery of it all, John Phyllis, but they've got to have somebody attached for a con you can't conspire with yourself, mm. basically. So poor John uh, got pulled into it as well. And that's the way they were able to, to do us in. How do you not feel bitter amongst it all at the time? Or I'm sure you maybe you yeah. did, but I mean, coming from your own party as well. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? Because I don't, and I, I didn't. Um, my wife at the time did, and my family did. I mean, they were absolutely fuming with it. Um, but none of us fell out with the Labour Party, funnily enough, because it wasn't really the Labour Party. It was individuals, and really nasty individuals uh, within the party who had conspired, as I say, to, to deliver this. Um, but the other thing, perhaps it was just because you know, I'm a very practical person. And my first thought was, I'm gonna pay the mortgage. So I didn't really have time to be mm. bitter, mm. you know, because you can spend an awful lot of time, can't you say, well, well, if he'd have done that and if she'd have done this mm. and if only. Um, but my job then was to just to, to, to go and earn a living. Food on the and, table. Yeah, and, and luckily for me, um, there were some really good people who phoned me up and said, this is a load of bollocks. Mm. Um, and so what can we do to help? And so there was a guy called Len Collinson, sadly passed now, who ran a really successful, like internationally successful consultancy company, but he was based in Salford. And Len was one of the people who I'd done some work with through Lancashire Enterprises. He phoned and said, come and see me. What are you gonna do? I said, well, I said, well what can I do? You know, well, you've got a fraud charge over, uh, hanging over your head. So you're not gonna be able to get a job okay right that's helpful that way yeah. <laughs> he said you've got to you've got to become a consultant he said you've got such a great network of people that you know you, you're bright you, you know the way the european parliament works you know how education works you know how this works you know you need to become a consultant um so okay how do i how do i do that so he sort of taught me through a bit of a business plan and then he says uh, two things before i went he said phone this guy I gave him the number of a fella called Lee Kai Hung. I said, okay, I'll give him a ring. Uh, and then he said, and there's a, a, a letter um, for your wife, Tracy. So I, his wife at the time, Shirley and, and, and my missus, 
knew each other. Um, so it just takes this envelope, th thought it was a like a sympathy card almost, you know, or just like thinking of you. Anyway, she opens this letter and uh, there's a check for five thousand pounds. Oh, just in an incredible gesture yeah. from them, you know. Um, and I phoned him up and said, "What?" You know, he said, "Well, that will see you through the next couple of months whilst you get your business mm. going." He said, and, "You know," I said, "Well, how do, how do I pay this back?" He said, "Never want that back. Don't even speak to me about it mm. again." Wow. So what a fabulous yeah, it's like your faith gesture. in your faith in politics crashed down in one, on one <laughs> hand, and then your faith in humanity yeah. like yeah. built up in the right hand. You know I, what I mean? Absolutely. And actually, you know, I'd say to, I, I would say in in absolute honesty, my faith in politics didn't crash because, no. as I say, and yet I very much identified that it was it was a group of individual people mm. who were just horrible people simple as mm. you know and uh, and as much as i could understand them trying to do me in politically get me deselected not support me for particular positions going to the police with trumped up charges i, I think that's beyond yeah. politics vindictive almost isn't it? oh so, you know. yeah absolutely mm. was absolutely was but you know am i thankful absolutely so you know the listening <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> thanks very much and what happened with this charger that's hanging over your head? So, so I just, again, you know, you've got to park that in a sense because these things drag on, uh, as we know. I mean, we're, we're in the middle of a controversy in Liverpool at the moment. And listen, mm. that's not coming to a conclusion anytime soon. We might get into that later. I'm happy to speak about it to, to the point I can. Um, but I just cracked on. This guy that Lena put me in touch with, as Lee Kai Hung, he was a very, very successful Chinese businessman bought Roy Keane's house off him, so that demonstrates the the sort of money he had. And I ended up so, doing some work um, linking Chinese governments with British governments, um, doing agreements, educational institutions, UCLan, Liverpool University, that sort of thing. That then got me into Everton, who were looking to get into the Chinese market at the time. So did a bit of work with Everton and this guy his education foundation, Chinese governments, all that sort of thing. So was uh, going over to China quite a bit. Again, fascinating, great experience for me. And in the background, you know, all that stuff's going on, about the court case, and I'm going to see solicitors every sort of five minutes. But again, I think it'd be remiss of me not to mention and, and perhaps explain why I was just cracking on with my business. I had a really brilliant barrister whose name I can unforgivably never remember but I went to see him and he said Mr McKenna juries are funny things he said so I never ever say to anybody that I'm representing that they're going to get found not guilty because you just never know I thought oh great he said but I'm saying to you now you are not going to get found guilty this is the load, biggest load of bollocks I have ever seen presented in my life and from that moment on and this is like a really clever guy, yeah. Mm. He's not gonna give you that guarantee if it's not right. Mm. And from that moment on, the whole court case, I just left. Mm. I thought, it'll get there when it gets there. I'm not gonna get found guilty, I've done nothing wrong. We knew we had no overspent on the election anyway. Um, and, you know, to very quickly draw a line under that because it didn't play as big a part in my life as people think it did. It ended up in Chester Crown Court, about three years to get there, I think. We were in, John and I were in the same dock as Myra Hindley and the guy that. Really, yeah? Yeah, same dock Jeez, in Chester Christ, County Court. It's not something you were. <laughs> That's to be claimed to fame. Yeah, How nice. Say, yeah. Jury was sworn in, and then my barrister stands up and explains what the case is. And you could see the judge getting angrier and angrier mm. as my barrister is, or QC, I should say is basically present the nonsense of the case. So he said, I'm going to adjourn and I'll come back tomorrow with, with what I think. <laughs> so the judge just came back the next day, apologised to me, apologised to John, tore a strip off the Crown Prosecution Service and the police, dismissed the jury and the case was gone wow. after a day. So people say to me, well, it was all right, it was only a day. Yeah. It's like five years from yeah. the day. Yeah, yeah. The initial complaint appeared in private eye mm. 
and we walk away from court. It's the stuff people don't see, I guess, though, isn't it? And it's obviously like, you know, you're saying your kids were there, like there was a dawn raid and then stuff like that. Like people think, oh, you know, you, it's good, you got off in court, but mm. you don't actually see the stuff that <laughs> yeah, go, go and behind the scenes. Yeah, and I think again, you know, a couple of things helped me there. I think I'd done a really good job for people in Skin, yeah. so I was well liked. Um, and so I never ever sort of felt as though I was isolated at home or I couldn't go out. Mm. Kids never got bullied at school. There was not, and it was very high profile. I mean, this is lead story on the regional news mm. and was on the national news. You know, it wasn't like small fry. It wasn't like some local politicians just mm. being done. It was quite a high profile thing at the time. But the people in Skem, and again, probably one of the reasons that I've still got an awful lot of emotional attachment to the place, were absolutely 100% supportive, mm. which was great. And I think the other thing that, you know, helped us, I say, is that we had a situation which most people who understand that politics realised it was just mm. a load of shine. And the political editor for the BBC is a guy called Jim Hancock, who works with me now at downtown. And he was great because whereas some of these stories come and then people forget about them, he just kept on. So he kept phoning the police up saying, what's happening with this case? Why hasn't Mr. McKenna been charged? You know, what, what's happening with the court case? And when we got cleared, we literally were wall-to-wall -wall press. Like every newspaper in the country covered it. The BBC, again, headlines, front, uh, top story uh, on Northwest. National News, ITV covered it as well. So, you know, as much as it was frustrating those three or four years, I couldn't have asked for more in terms of support from the community and also support from some of my media contacts and colleagues that I'd sort of mm. come across along the way in terms of my political career. It's interesting, what you think, as someone who, you know, you look at politics now and you, you hope, like you say, people like, you know, the picture you painted, you know, people who want to make things better. Mm. But then there are those horrible people who are mm. just trying to, you know, rip people back. You're thinking, mm. life's hard enough, yeah. you know, do you know what I mean? There's people there trying to do yeah. better. Why are you, do you know what I mean? I'm, yeah. I'm surprised though. I mean, it's great character from you to not be frustrated yeah. and bitter by it, but I'm sitting here now thinking, <laughs> And I'm, I'm frustrated by it, you know what I mean? <laughs> I think the, I'm frustrated for, for the town because, you, you know, we had actually started to do some really good things in, in Skem at the time. And after I went, sadly, there was nobody. I'm not saying there weren't people who didn't care as much because, of course, there were. But there wasn't anybody who were ever going to be able to articulate the case for mm. the place in, in the way that I was. Who had the connections. You know, I was mm. well connected nationally. I had European connections. We managed to get like millions of pounds into the town of European funded uh, on the back of, uh, of some of that work I was doing. So, as I say, we had some good people there, but not with that sort of influence, not with the, the vision, I don't think, to, mm. to deliver. And the town has gone backwards, unquestionably. It's starting to get a bit better now. But I think the other thing I'd say, again, you know, as you get older, you start to understand and appreciate this a bit more. You couldn't pick up a newspaper without my face being in it. I was on the, the telly far more than I should have been. I, you know, sometimes you've got to look at yourself and think, did I just take the piss a bit? And, you know, it's okay winning uh, and beating people. And I did that for the right reasons, because as I say, those people were past the sell by date. Some of them should never have been councillors anyway. I kid you not, some of them couldn't read or write, and they were councillors. So it was, it was absolutely the right decision for me to get rid of those people and replace them with new people. But did I do that in the compromise and fashion that I would now? No, I was probably a bit too hard. So when you say those people are horrible, well, yeah, they were. It's got rubbed up the wrong way. But I yeah. was, I, was I nice? <laughs> mm. Well, I wasn't to them, was I? Mm. I was seen as the devil incarnate. Mm. Now, as I said earlier, had they devised a way of defeating me through political processes, mm. that's fair enough. But I think once you start making stories up, once you start having what I can only describe as corrupt meetings with police officers, mm. because that's the only way mm. in which this complaint goes anywhere. It was an absolute joke. You know, the more you look at it, mm. you know, in the end, I think they worked out, even by their calculations, 
the had we overspent on the election. It was a big argument about whether leaflets that we got were free or should have been charged for. But no one, again, nobody suggested we pay for them. The final calculation was, well, you overspent on an election by £60. Pound. £60. Oh. Pound. £3 million pound investigation. It's crazy, isn't And it? I did say at the time, you know, if the police would have offered me a million quid, I'd have walked. <laughs> Didn't have to go through all that trouble. Mm. Um, so I see where you're coming from, Andy, but I think if you've been involved in frontline politics for 15 years, as I had at that point, you've gone through some of the battles that we've gone through. You've done some people in, as I say, my opinion, always sort of very transparently. I never told anyone I was going to support them if I wasn't. I always told people if I thought they weren't doing a job and I was going to come after them for that. I always gave them the opportunity to walk away before we got into a battle with them. But equally, I'd have been less in your face. I'd have been a bit more thoughtful about the way in which uh, we carried out that sort of process of modernising the Labour Party in Lancashire and West Lancashire. And I'd certainly have not have wanted to appear in the Skelmersdale advertiser every week 73 times. <laughs> and it was, I mean, one, one week, even my dad said, fucking hell, so. He said, What's the, when are they going to rename this? The Frank McKenna advertiser. <laughs> it was like every pay. So, again, I think I got a bit intoxicated yeah. with that much success. I said relatively young age, really, in p political mm. terms. At that point as well, like once you're kind of finding your feet with the, in the consultancy, was it a bit of you've kind of been bad in politics, or was it I'm actually really enjoying this consultancy work? I mean, is that where it kind of then? I never really enjoyed the consultancy work um, because, uh, again, I, I think this is just something within me. I'm not good at just going into a place and doing piecemeal work if that. You know, I like to do things that, as I said earlier, you're making a difference and you feel as though you're making a difference. And of course you could say, well, if you're doing deals between Chinese governments and twinning arrangements with local authorities, that's making a difference. I haven't seen how these twinning arrangements work. Not really. You mm -hmm. know, there's not millions of trade deals between us and New York, is there, uh, sadly. And we've been swimming with them forever. So, you know, I always felt a little bit frustrated, if I'm honest, in terms of the consultancy business. And, and you know, the, the consolation, of course, was the money. Because as a consultant, you are getting paid on a daily rate. I've never been, I've never had as much money in my life. So by the time we got to the end of the core case, you know, it would have been very easy for me to just continue as a consultant um, and get whatever was getting paid. I reckon at that time, and we're talking about 2003, 2004, maybe. no, about 2003 it was. Um, I was probably earning about six grand a month on mm. consultancy. That's, you know, that was good for me. Yeah. Mm. For a lad who was from Bootle, mm. you know, you know this, Andy, you're yeah, six yeah. grand. Yeah. That's brilliant, you know. So at that time, I sort of had a, a bit, I was at a bit of a crossroads because obviously the first thing people say is, when are you going back into politics? Mm. And it, it wasn't that I'd fallen out of love with politics at all, but I think Blair had either gone or was going, and I was a massive supporter of New Labour. The party, for me, hadn't continued its modernisation in the way I'd have hoped to have seen, and so there was still an awful lot of this old guard around, and it looked to me as though they were going to take over again, or at least start to have more influence in the party. And then... I also had the situation where could I afford to go back into politics because you are in mm. so, and as I said earlier you know about a benefit claimant we're the same once you start getting six thousand pounds in your bank account yeah, your month, you start you start spending it mm. so I had all those things and I thought well okay if I'm going to carry on in the private sector I'm not going to carry on as a consultant and by this time I'd started to basically have a suite of clients an awful lot of whom were property developers in Liverpool. And the reason they'd initially approached me was because the City Council's planning department at that time, sadly it's defaulted to this position now, was say no. <laughs> so if anyone has to build, just say no. And so what these guys wanted was somebody who knew the way around local government, knew who to talk to and influence in the right way, without going through the expense of taking appeals and 
months and months of waiting for planning permissions to be granted. So by the time 2003, the court case happens, I think I had about half a dozen property companies who I was working with. And it was a bit daft really, because I was going to the city council here and I was talking to them about the same issues, but on different sites. Um, one of the guys who's still a member of ours, a guy called Dave Anastasio Ilias. Um, so I just got them all at the living room. Mm. I had the private dining room there, got them all in and said, look guys, we can carry on the way we are. And it was a tough meeting because none of them wanted to tell each other what they were doing. There's this thing of prophecy to, oh, don't want to tell George down and what I'm, oh, I don't want to tell Mike Hanlon. And so we had a little bit of that. But I said, this is daft because, you know, it's harder because we're arguing individual cases. Let me create something that, as I, I described this at the time, as a trade union for property developers in Liverpool. And they went, okay, great. And we'll call it downtown. And that's how, mm, that's how downtown fantastic. started. So it was, it was literally a property developers forum to enable me to argue on their behalf collectively. Mm. That's the basis of the downtown Liverpool concept when I came up with it in 2003. So it's been going since then, 2003? Yes. Yeah, wow. yeah. But you, you never had no sort of ambition to, I uh, know when once this business come out, was there no, like, like I'm leaving the consultancy, I'm going back to try and pick up where I left off in politics? Did you, like, not? I went back uh, in 2017, I think. No, 2015, it must have been. Uh, back onto the district council in West Lang. So I did a four year stint there, but it was just wasn't the same yeah. uh, for all sorts of reasons caliber of the officers wasn't as good powers the councils have got now not as great as they were then west lancashire much smaller than lancashire anyway and then <laughs> i think it was three or four months after i got re-elected corbyn became leader of the labor party it's just turned me right off mm -hmm. to be honest um so i've not i didn't have a passion to go back I, I i was almost persuaded to go back for for all sorts of reasons didn't really have the appetite for it, I don't think. Certainly didn't have the ambition to start becoming a leader and all that sort of thing again. Um, but the reason I think I'm comfortable with that is that what downtown has developed into is something that was a quite a relatively small property developers forum in Liverpool to something which now represents 900 businesses across the country. And I talk to politicians every day so I'm still very involved in politics. Yeah. I still feel as though I'm making a difference and I'm still able to combine my passion of business, networking and politics with mm -hmm. what I do every day. And I, I, you know, again, I go back to Len Collinson, the one th piece of advice he gave me at that uh, fateful meeting when he gave me the five grand check was whatever you do, make sure you enjoy it. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't enjoy anything more. So, you know, a couple of years ago, I don't think Best this is any secret. Worlds, really. Yeah, people, you know, I got approached to, to, to put myself forward for Mayor of Liverpool. And, you know, I'm not saying I wasn't tempted, but it was a temptation that lasted about 30 seconds. Because then you start to think about mm. all the crap that goes with that mm. job. I what think when you're young, sorry, when you're young and you know you've got big ambition, I think it, it, it all seems great, doesn't it? But then once you, as you say, you've seen the inside of politics and you see how quickly things can turn around don't you I guess that, that like <laughs> young like I don't know what you'd call it we would call it ambition wouldn't you it, it does it get dampened doesn't yeah, it yeah it is ambition I, I don't think it's that that stopped me I think that that you know I've done 12 years and then as I say I did another four which weren't as uh, as enjoyable but if you were to say to me you know during that, those those 12 years on a scale of 1 to 10 how much did you enjoy that I'd say 11 mm. And so it's again, it's a case of, you know, they say don't, don't never go back. So I think there's a little bit of that as well. But I also think, you know, politics then and politics now, would I have enjoyed that period of time over those 11 years as much if we'd have had Twitter? I fucking very much doubt yeah. it. Uh, again, and people had everything. camera phones all over Brussels every time we went over there. Because again, I'll say this very openly now. You know, we used to fucking work hard and we got literally millions of pounds out of Brussels that Lancashire would never have got if I wasn't over there making those trips. But did I play hard when I was over there? Absolutely, I loved it, mm -hmm. absolutely loved it. So I used to go over, I used to work really hard for the people of Lancashire, which was proved by the results that we got. 
But if you'd have been following me around overnight with a camera phone, yeah. I'd have probably had to resign in, been in court 1998, <laughs> you know. So, so I, I think there's that as well as there's yeah. the environment mm -hmm. people operate in as well. And I think one of the reasons why we're seeing less and less interest in people becoming politicians is because of that unfair, intense interest. The scrutiny is horrendous. Mm -hmm. isn't oh, it? Awful. Well, one thing you mentioned then about Corbyn, which I, I found fascinating and being from Liverpool, Corbyn to me, Scousers seem to put him as this godlike figure. And you mentioned something before about, you know, in politics, you know, you've got to win. So you've got to be pragmatic. And I always think Corbyn kind of used to say things, you know, in, in an ideal world. You think, oh, well, well, that's all work great. But then you think, are you actually going to win? No, you're not going to. And I can't never really seen anything with him. Which comes back to the question for you. How have you found with politics about it's so kind of, you're a scouser, you're Labour, that's it. Boom, it doesn't matter who it is, you, that's it. And again, as I've got older, I mean, I'm obviously still Labour, but when it comes to the leaders, I've kind of learned as I became older, you don't have to like every leader and you can actually... Does that, has that frustrated you over the years, have you found? Liverpool frustrates me massively politically. Mm. Um, I think that we, we do ourselves a, a huge disservice in terms of the way we carry on. Um, I think our city council uh, now uh, is is a poor city council. I think when you have a city council that makes decisions to say we don't want to invest in any expansion of our airport, when it's one of the most successful airports operating in the country at the moment, is the politics of lunacy. I think that we take up causes and appear to be whingers far more than any other city. And there's absolutely no need for it. I think if you talk to people about their perception of Liverpool, it's as though we always need a handout. When actually, no other city in the country is as entrepreneurial as this place. So we absolutely don't need a handout. But then I've got to distinguish between the city and its politicians. And we're poorly served by our politicians at the moment. I think we've got inexperienced politicians I think they're quite narrow-minded in terms of the issues that interest them. They're not in the least bit concerned about the economy. They don't understand it. They don't understand why you need to be commercial. They don't appreciate that to redistribute wealth, you've got to create wealth. And so you've got a very, very small number of people who run cities. And in our city's case, it's people who as I say, have got more faults, in my opinion, than they have attributes. That being said, who do you blame for that? Mm. Because we elect them. We decide whether we're, we're going to embroil ourselves in the tedium of branch meetings, constituency meetings, and all the things that you have to do if you want to become a politician. And so we've all got to take some responsibility for the position that the city's in. And again, I don't think that we're particularly well served by our local newspaper. So you haven't even got that vehicle mm. to sort of push back against some of the, I can only describe as idiocy that comes out of the town all the time. Again, let me make it clear. I'm not saying that any of those people are bad people. And I'm not saying that they think that what they're doing to Liverpool is bad. The fact is, though, it doesn't do us any favours. Mm. And I actually don't think that the politics in this city at the moment represents the vast majority of people. Yeah. And if you want any solid evidence of that, you only have to look at the turnout for the consultation over the mayoral role last week. So they've had this massive consultation, spent over £100,000 trying to say to people, do you want a mayoral model or do you want to change? Less than 4% of people bothered to respond. I think the general, wow. I think everything you've just said is the reason that I don't, I have no interest. It, well, I have interest on a broad sense, but I wouldn't vote for any politician yeah. from any party because, it's like you said before, whether you agree with Corbyn, you agree with my view, I feel that I feel in the middle about it. But anyone who tries to do something different, or for example, someone who tries to say, well, why don't we try it this way? Because it's not in the model of politics. I don't think it would ever get through. Yeah. And it's like what you said before, you could be as Labour as you want, as Tory as you want. At some point, you have to get into bed or you have to make an agreement mm. with someone that you don't necessarily agree with. So for someone like me, who has to find something to believe in, I don't think you can ever truly believe in somebody because you'll never understand what goes on behind closed doors. 
So for me, if I, if I seen someone coming up now young and he's making all these things and I'm like, yeah, I agree with that. I know because I'm intelligent enough to know at some point he's going to have to go, okay, look, I don't quite agree with that, but I'm going to have to get in bed with it. And I think that's the problem with politics because we all want to win and you know we all want the person we sort of agree with the most to be at the top of the country. But I don't think the person at the top of the country represents anyone. I, I think the person who gets there is a blend of, is somebody who's made enough like nice sort of deals with people just to get there, but I don't think he represents any one party. I think the leader will always have a bit of every party. In it. But I think then you, you come back to the point that I always make, which is, is politics black and white or is it grey? Mm. And let me use a football analogy to you, uh, and I'll use my team because it's easier to do so. Now, when Frank Lampard took over as manager uh, midway through last season and Everton were in a relegation battle, it was quite clear in the first six or seven games that Frank wanted Everton to play like Brazil, right? Mm. And if he'd continue to do that, we'd be playing championship football next season. As an Evertonian, when he made that very astute decision to compromise and to start playing long to Calvert-Lewin, get a few knockdowns, get in people's faces, we survived, albeit by a hair's breath. Mm. Now, as a football supporter, I would say the purest, I'd love Everton to play like Brazil every week, but I want to win. And if you want to win, you've got to compromise. Politics is no different. And when you say to me, well, I want a prime minister who is absolutely pure to what I think, mm -hmm. the prime minister represents supposedly, as best they can, over 70 million people in this country. And the best one in the world, 70 million people aren't gonna agree on anything. Yeah. Right, we, we, the three of us can come up with at least ten things we disagree on. Mm. So the best that you can get from your politicians, somebody who tells you what they're going to do, mm. who sticks to that, and if they don't stick to it, or if they lie, or if they cheat, or if they become below the public standards that we have come to expect as a country, they resign and get out the way. Mm. That's mm. all you can expect. A standards not subjective though. No, because, because absolutely not. Listen. I, I can have an argument about Tony Blair. I think Tony Blair is the best Prime Minister that I've had in my lifetime. I can even have an argument about Margaret Thatcher and tell you why I think some of the things she did were good, right? Because I look at politics objectively rather than subjectively. But Thatcher, Blair, would never in a million, Gordon Brown, David Cameron, Theresa May, John Major, they would never have locked the country down, sanctioned parties, got court sanctioning the parties, and not resigned. Mm. That is beyond a level of mistrust that we have never seen in this country before. And the, the fear I have about this government, and I'm talking about the government, I'm not talking about the Conservative Party, I'm not talking about Conservative MPs, I've got lots of Conservative MPs who I talk to get on with, and they are privately as fuming as we are over this. And and in fact, over a hundred of them actually went through the, the, mm. the polling booth the other week to prove that. I'm telling you now, this government is, I won't even use the word corrupt because it's not even that subtle. They are just a law unto themselves. Mm. It's one rule for them. I've never come across a government this bad. Never, never come across a cabinet who will consistently lie, cheat, break the rules, and think we can get away with this. Mm. But if, say, the, the common person has standards then, as we say, and we say, right, we want you to stay to these standards, and if you don't, then, then you know, you're out and we move on with politics. But they clearly don't, would never listen to those standards. That but that's only this, that's only this cabinet. I mean, and, and I think you've got to distinguish between this group of people and there's even people within that cabinet, by the way, who's going to be appalled by Boris Johnson. Yeah. But they're thinking, well, if he goes, I'm going. Mm. Because no one else is going to... You know, who else is going to appoint Pretty Patel as Home Secretary? Mm. You know, Nadine Dorries as oh, Culture gosh. Minister. You know, so the self-interest there, my view is that in the past you've had politicians who've been big enough and bold enough and honest enough from whichever party to say, well, at times, the mm. country's interests and the integrity of government is more important than my personal career. We haven't got people like that in the cabinet. Yeah. I think wait, it's wait, just 
Yeah, no, with that, again, you make a great point, and I think that's why probably you can tell, but like, like Jordan, you're sounding like people are disinterested in mm. politics because yeah. of the mistrust. But even on a local level, when we had all the Joe Anderson stuff, I mm. mean, Joe sat there and it was quite funny actually. I think the podcast was it looked for a couple of weeks like we were just staring in the pox. I had Joe Anderson on one week and Lawrence Kenwright on the next. And um, what's ever I'm, happened to him? Yeah, well, so I'm, I remember Lawrence sitting exactly there, and it almost sounds a little bit like what you were saying in the sense that Liverpool Council it does need to be entrepreneurial, you know, it does need to invest in, and that's what kind of Lawrence was saying, and a lot of his ideas. And I think the idea of having someone who's been involved in business in, in, in politics would be good for a city like Liverpool. But I think even on a local level, you've got people who just, after all the Joe Anderson things come out, have just got such a such a bad view mm. on politicians. Mm. I don't know how... I mean, I could sit here talking to you, and you've made me feel great about it, on your kind of career that you had to think, mm. well, yeah, you know, owned up himself, said, look, you know, he, he played hard, but, but fuck me, did he work hard? And mm. what, you know, I could trust something like that, mm. but then the overwhelming kind of view on politics from my own city to what we see on the news every day... I think I've done a tweet this morning. Every time you put Sky News on, it's a Labour, it's a Conservative um, member of Parliament defending someone else. Yeah. <laughs> it's not about helping people anymore. Yeah. It's just like defending the mates. All how how does this turn round both on a local level and a and a bigger national level? Mm. I think inevitably it'll turn around nationally because I think he's done. You, you know, you, you're looking at the dying embers of Boris Johnson's government, and I think what will inevitably happen then is will go to the point where we elect somebody who will not be able to go beyond those boundaries again. What we've got to recognise here, by the way, isn't just the damage this is doing to the indigenous population of the UK in terms of our view of politicians and the undermining that then has of democracy. Our international reputation is shot. shot again. Nobody trusts him as far as he can throw him. You know, okay, the guy from Ukraine might say, oh, Boris, my mate, that's only because he's given billions of quid. Mm -hmm. Probably doesn't think he's a nice fella, really, no. but, you know. Um, so I think once Johnson goes, you will start to see a clear-up of politics. And as I say, it, it's unprecedented, this. You, you know, I remember the major government where the guy, Meller, got caught having an affair and... There's a picture on the front page with him in a Chelsea shirt, mocked up because his lover had said that he wore a Chelsea. You know, you think at that level. Yeah, compared to now. And he resigned mm. the day after, by the way, Mella, to what's going on now, where none of them resign for anything. Mm. It's just absolutely mm. night and day. Isn't I it? think that's the problem. Like, if someone come to me and said, right, these have gone now, the, the new wave's on its way through, do you want to get back involved? Do you want to take an interest? Do you want to vote this person, that person? I would say what makes them different to what's just happened. And that's just me being pessimistic, well, I think but you, I think I you know, would if represent I, If I can just make, make the obvious point here, um, you know, whether you love, loathe, or, or neither, Keir Starmer, mm. if he gets a fixed penalty notice, he's resigning. Yeah. Now, that's integrity. You know, I, I think, I'll be again, I'll be honest, I've said this to his people, I think he's daft given what Boris Johnson's done. Mm. But then, as they would argue back, and as Keir Starmer would push back and say, well, you've got to start somewhere. Who draws the line in the sand? Now, Keir Starmer is saying to you, if I get fined, if I get found to be have broken the law, I will resign. That's the least you should expect from a prime minister. This fella's been found that he was he's hosted more illegal raves mm. in his house during lockdown than anywhere else. Collectively in the whole country, cumulatively, None of us did that. You put, put everything else that happened again, and he won't resign. So I think I'd say to you, you know, again, be careful. You know, we can all say, oh, they're all the same. Mm -hmm. They're clearly not, because you've got one fella, and this is not to do with party politics, by the way, because if a Labour leader would have done what Johnson's done, I'll tell you now, I'd have ripped my card up. Mm -hmm. right? I came close to it with Corbyn, but I certainly would have been carrying on the way Johnson has. Starmer has said to you, if I get found breaking the law, I will resign. Prime Minister said to you, it doesn't matter what I get caught doing, I'm not resigning. Mm. And you're saying to me, I won't vote for any of them, they're all the same. Mm, yeah, but I just believe <laughs> actions speak louder than words. And I d Is it what more can yeah. he say? No, I, I, he can say whatever he wants. I just don't So think you want him action. to break the law, resign, and say, no, there no, you go, no, I told not, you. Not him as an individual. I think politics as a generalisation, I don't see any action that would get for me, just me personally, that would make me go, do you know what? That might be different. You'd have to give him the chance, though, wouldn't you? You well, just saying that. You, yeah, but that's like saying, right, if Johnson goes, then the next person who comes in behind him, if the Tories stay in, just give him a chance. 
But you've what got else to, can you do though? You've got you to, haven't you? Because, yeah. Or, or you get into a situation mm. where you end up with fellas like him laughing at fellas like us mm. for the rest of our lives. Because yeah. as though we think, well, every day we just crack on. It doesn't matter what they do. I promise you, it does, because they are impacting on business in this city every single day of the week. As I say, our international reputation for a start is shot. And I think, you know, any country's personality is measured by the people who are leading it. Yeah. So for me, you know, I, I feel ashamed sometimes now when I go to Europe. You sort of, you know, yeah. mm. but by the way, I voted Remain. Mm. You know, you yeah. almost feel obliged to say it because yeah. it's a stupid decision for a country to make. But when you've got a leader like that, as well, if I've got, David Cameron, do, do I want, did I want David Cameron to be Prime Minister? No. Could I live with it? Yeah. Mm. Can I live with this fella? No. He's beyond. Yeah. He's beyond. What about closer to home then? Because obviously now the Tories have got kind of a hold on Liverpool in a sense and stuff. I mean, how does Liverpool recover politically as well? Difficult, I think. Uh, I mean, I don't think people necessarily appreciate how difficult position we're in. And... Um, you know, I think somebody's, it's almost like someone's pressed a big pause button on Liverpool at the moment because, you know, I've just come back from Manchester and you drive into Manchester, there's cranes, working cranes all over the city, all over the skyline. You've got Salford booming. The whole of Greater Manchester's being expanded. Loads of investment going on. I'm organising a parliamentary reception there tomorrow. Uh, we're campaigning for HS2. Um, which is, is going to Manchester, but they want the absolute premium model, which the right to want. You know, if it was in London, the argument that we're having tomorrow with parliamentarians wouldn't even be happening. And Manchester's flying. And that's always, you know, for me, bittersweet because I want Manchester to do well. It's a big northern city. We've got loads of great members in Manchester. But it does frustrate me that our city, as I say, has had this big pause button pressed. And it's such a shame because I think from 2008 and probably a little bit before that, to be fair, there was a momentum in this place that had seen us go from the doldrums, bit of a basket case, to there's a city on the up. We're having lots of interest from investors. We were seeing lots of jobs created. Okay, largely in the visitor economy, but nevertheless, good news story, people's perceptions of the place changing. And... You know, remember when Robert Jenrich, the housing minister at the time, stood up and said, uh, local government and housing minister, well, we're sending the commissioners into Liverpool, but that's not going to change anything in terms of what's happening there. Again, I won't say he was lying, but the proof of the puddle, right? So the commissioners have come in. I said at the time, I would have preferred the commissioners to have come in and taken over lock, stock and barrel or not to come in at all, because I don't think you can be a little bit pregnant. Mm. And what the commissioners are doing at the moment is, you know, you could come into my business tomorrow, Andy, and say, you're doing that wrong, you're doing that wrong, you're doing that wrong, and you're probably right. But if you've not got a solution, there's no point in you telling me what's wrong. Yeah. And I just get the impression at the moment, there's a report due out any time now from the commissioners that's apparently again gonna be a damning report but yeah, okay, so what are you going to do to sort it out then? Because I'm not interested anymore in all the problems that the City Council have got. I want to know how we're going to get out of this. Because for 12 months or more now, I'm seeing a city that is basically being allowed to decline. Manage decline was a word that mm -hmm. we throw around during the Thatcher years, which she never agreed to, by the way. Um, that's what's happening at the moment. Because I've got people who I work alongside, who are saying to me, can we get to an event in Birmingham? Can we get to an event in Wolverhampton? Can we get to an event in Leeds? Never mind Manchester, because we want to work and there's no action for us in Liverpool. Mm. Scouse businesses who can't do business in Liverpool. The amount of friends I've got in construction, I speak to Paul Cheatham quite a lot, you know, it's a shame anyone in business gets so frustrated that Liverpool now when they see Manchester, mm hive of activity and yet it's just nothing happening yeah, here absolutely and i think it's you know it's such a shame because as i say i think we did have that momentum behind us um 
we can't talk about the court case or the controversy. Do you know what is happening with that? Don't know. You can't say too much. But... I, the, the only I, only what everyone knows. You know what what you read in the papers and stuff. Um, and you know, for me, slow justice is no justice. I've been through it myself. I think there should be time limits on these investigations. But in this instance, you know, the personalities. I mean, I've, I've listened to no um, secrets. I got on with Joe Anderson. Yeah. Um, never had a penny off him, I should say. Um, but we got on well. I thought, Joe, um, whatever the outcome of the uh, investigation is, had the city's, you know, the good of the city in, uh, at heart and was trying to get things done. Now, whether he did that in the right or the wrong way, time will tell. But you've not only got Joe Anderson and the other people who've been charged whose lives this is impacting on. You've got a city. Mm. You know, unless and until a final decision is made as to whether those people are acting in a, an unlawful way or they actually weren't, we've got that cloud hanging over us. So for me, you know, it's not simply about whether we can get the commissioners working as efficiently as we can or get a new group of councillors and officers in who can start to make the thing sing again. It's about that tainted reputation that Liverpool now has hanging over it, being cleared away. Do you, do you find that now, <clears throat> now with your role with a downtown business, do you find that investors coming in and business people you work with, do you find that there's a black cloud mm. hanging over? It, it's it's very difficult for me, this Andy, because I want Liverpool to, to be flying again as quickly uh, as possible. Um, and so, you know, we do have a little bit of a, a self-imposed conspiracy amongst spokespeople for the city, so I'll just say it's all right. But that's never been my way. You know, the reason downtown started was because the city wasn't mm. doing okay, or it was probably only doing okay when it should have been doing great. So, you know, I, I, I can only answer this question honestly, and it might piss a few people off, but yeah, absolutely, it's having an impact on investors. People have said to me, we're not looking at Liverpool for at least another two years until this stuff is sorted out. And then when you have got people who've been able to attract investors in, and there are one or two of them, and I can't break confidence as they may or may not be bothered if it did, but they're then coming up against the brick wall of the city council. Now again, who do you blame? Do you blame the commissioners because they're sort of overseeing all this side of the business now or do you blame the officials mm. because they're not moving quick enough but in fairness to the officials again particularly those people outside of the executive team are you as a planning official sticking your head above the parapet to give someone permission to do something quick in this city when you think mm. I might get a knock on the door next week and again the only thing I'd say about all of this is let's get it done and dusted you know, I would just make a plea to the CPS and to the police, let's get this finished as quickly as we can. If they're guilty, then they absolutely need to be punished. But if they're not guilty, they need to be able to get on with their lives. But more importantly, the city needs to be able to get on as well. And just a final point on this, there's an investigation that is indirectly linked to all of the crap that's going on in Liverpool at the moment. And surprise, surprise, it started in Lancashire. It's nine years old, that oh. investigation. There's probably half a dozen people whose lives have been totally destroyed by that investigation, plus their families, including the former chief executive of Liverpool, Jeff Fitzgerald. Again, I have no clue as to whether they've done anything wrong or not. But nine years? It's no longer an investigation, is it? If it if well, if that years, came to yeah. me as a juror, I'm sorry, mm. or as a judge, I'd be saying, you, you're having a laugh. Nine years. So, you know, are we going to be sat here in nine years' time going, I wonder what ever happened to that mm. Joe Anderson case? I think probably, I think... Scandalous. Yeah, probably will. I always think, and a lot of the things you've said, it reminds me a little bit about, like, my time in Afghanistan, and almost mindset, and it's like, the government kind of have a plan, say a 10-year plan, for argument's sake, but when you're actually out there in six for six months, mm. you're thinking about getting home safe. Yeah. And it's a little bit like politics, you know, you can... When you said there about putting your head above the parapet, mm. it's like probably for the greater good you should be looking at the 10-year plan but 
it's only human to be a bit selfish and think, <laughs> yeah. fucking hell, you know, I've only yeah. got six months here and yeah. oh, I'll just, you know. So I, I can see it from both mm. sides in a way, do you know what I mean? And it's, yeah. it's like you say, it's a tricky situation to be in. It is, and I think there's always that dilemma as a politician. I remember, you know, doing this myself when I was a, 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 a making these decisions. You've got to balance that political pragmatism with is this the right thing for the longer term? Mm. And again, I can say this now because I'm not in politics. We made decisions that I've had to sort of close my eyes and think, oh, I'm not quite sure whether this is right, but that's gonna win me more votes. Yeah. And that is one of the inevitable problems that you've got with democracy. And you can never change that. You're never gonna be able to get anybody to make a decision where mm. they say, but that well, needs actually, to I don't care. Because that needs to well, it's a, well, the fellow who did do that, of course, was Tony Blair. Mm. <laughs> that he can't move now without security, mm. taking him for a coffee. So, you know, I think that... Now, no, listen, that was a big decision, yeah? And people like you got caught up in that decision. And I was I against... think, though, if, if he never done that, he'd be known, wouldn't he? I mean, you already... I mean, it's, it's a big black mark against your name, but Correct. apart from that, I mean... Oh, without doubt. I mean, he introduced, you know, you, you, Jordan was saying earlier, well, you know, they're all a little bit the same. They're all, a, they don't take a risk. Listening, that 97 government, right, the Labour government took risks, mm. introduced the minimum wage, right? Massive stories every day of the week in the mail, the Telegraph, the Express. That's going to cost three million jobs in the UK, introducing the minimum wage. Labour stood on that platform, won it. Sure start. Got more kids out of poverty, more mums out of poverty into jobs because we invested billions, if not billions of pounds into the Short Star programme. Highest investments ever into the NHS, highest investments ever into education, highest investments ever into law and order. What did mm. Tony Blair ever do for us? Mm. Cities regenerated, Liverpool, Leeds, Glasgow, Manchester, Edinburgh, mm. all received literally hundreds of millions of pounds of government investment to regenerate. I think we're almost 30 years on though, and that, that, that's what I was trying to look at it from that point of view. We're 30 years on from them great decisions. I don't, in my opinion, I don't see anyone making a good decision. I don't see anyone making a decision that's worth me backing. I don't see anyone making a decision that's different from anybody else. And I ultimately think that's the problem. I think, I, it's not that I wouldn't like give anyone the time or the trust or whatever. I just don't see it. And I think, that, in my opinion, in life, business, you know, in whatever, the eye test doesn't lie, in my opinion, and that's all I can see. I'm not in the House of Commons, I'm not in yeah. these meetings. For people like me, all you can see is what's happening with your eyes, yeah. and, you know, I'm not doubting that, you know, them decisions were great, 1997, that's, that's great, but I just think now, it, I, I can understand why people are pessimistic, oh, uh, I, eternally pessimistic. I, I can absolutely understand why people are cynical about politics mm. now, um, but I think that comes from the top. Yeah. And, and as much as, you know, you are somebody who follows politics mm -hmm. and so you can legitimately say to me well I, I can't really see much difference and in policy terms you know in some respects you would say listen you've got a Tory government now that's spending more money publicly than any government's ever spent Corbyn wouldn't have been able to spend this much money to being hung mm -hmm. our public borrowings are ridiculously high you've got a Tory government that's taxing business more than any other Tory government um, more than any government has ever taxed business uh, and you've got, you know, on Ukraine, for example, I think he's pursuing a policy that I would back. So there's three key areas where I would say policy-wise, very hard to fall out with the Tory government. Might not be my colour, but it's like, again, I'll use the football analogy. If I was told you've got a free ticket to go and watch a Premier League game, next week you can go and watch City or Liverpool. I'd have to grin and bear it and say, well, if I really want to enjoy the game, I'm going to go and watch Liverpool because they play more exciting football. Man City might be better at getting results, wins them an extra point, got away with a penalty decision of goodness. But I'd rather go and watch Liverpool. Mm. So my political allegiance might be to Labour, but I can see there's some policies the Tories have been. This is beyond politics. That's what I'm saying to you, Jordan. This is between people in power who think they can blatantly lie to us and get away with it, and it is one rule for them, which is basically going back to the fucking doff your cap days, right? And by the way, it's not that long ago that my granddad was able to queue up at the docks and stick his hands up and open one of them pricks and say, yeah, you, yeah. right? And if he found out he was Catholic, he wasn't getting a job, right? That's where they're going back to. Now, I don't give a fuck, to be honest, 
whether we've got a Tory Prime Minister whose policies I vehemently disagree with, but who plays by the rules. Mm. I don't care if I've got a Labour Prime Minister who I vehemently disagree with, as long as they play by the This lot, Rhys Mogg, Boris Johnson, Pretty Patel, you know, it's beyond my comprehension how we as a country can allow people like that to be running our lives, and that's what we're doing. I totally agree. Like, it's not the policies, yeah. even. Yeah. As I say, I can I can find policies where I can say, actually, I think you're doing okay mm-hmm. there. Yeah. But as personalities, come on. Yeah, and I totally agree. Like the, the bull- I'd elect Mr. Like. Blobby over this guy. If there was a general election, like in a in a mythical world, do you think they'd win again? Straight like no, now? I think it'd be a hung parliament. Because I think the country is split. I think one of the reasons Boris Johnson's still there is the Tory party can't identify an alternative that they think would absolutely win. And so it goes back to your point, Andy. Politicians are always playing that game of, well, I might not like it, but are we going to get the votes? Um, but I think they will get rid of him. I think he's, listen, he's done. Uh, it's just a case of when rather than if now. And depending on who they elect, if they elect, if Sunak could sort of reinvigorate himself, I think he's done himself damage by sticking with Johnson. He should have resigned six weeks ago, I think. Um, but soon I could come back. I think somebody like Penny Mordaunt, who's been very sort of under the radar, has never, from what I can see, publicly backed Bar- Boris Johnson's party gate shenanigans and all the other stuff he's got up to. I think they caused Labour a problem. I think the Tories could win again if they elected somebody like that. But equally, I think if Kia gets through the part the Durham be a gate thing um, and sticks to his guns on some of the stuff that he's doing then I'd still say you know the odds are hung parlance and then it'd be a case of, and again it's the thing that you know we all hate but it's the absolute art of politics is who gets the best deal then with the Lib Dems and the other mm. I think you uh, what you said earlier is probably the way I think about it not into black and white I think it's yeah. grey isn't it mm. I mean, I never normally speak politics because I don't understand a lot of it, to be honest. And it's been it's been great talking to you. To bring it closer to home as well, because I know I have to start wrapping up soon. I bloody school run to do. Um, <laughs> what what are your views and stuff on both from a political uh, point of view, but also business and also personal on obviously Everton's new ground? It's been kind of murky waters with so many different mm-hmm. things. I mean, what do you want to see happen? Where can you see happening? What are the factors? I mean, from what you can see. Mm-hmm. Well, Everton's uh, business model is broke, isn't it? Because, you know, you can't spend half a billion pounds and be embroiled in a relegation fight. And I think uh, as much as, you know, it hurts me to say financial fair play is a joke, and it is, the fact of the matter is we had an opportunity of circumventing that by getting the recruitment right. I think it's clear to see from statements that have been made by Marcel Brands and others in and around the club, either publicly or privately, that the owners, whether that be Mashiri or whether it be the investor that was Usmanov, have had a direct involvement in football and decisions. And I think you go back to the days of Bill Shankly, who threatened to resign once when Liverpool's directors sold Johnny Morrissey to Everton over his head and they had to persuade him to stay. Wish that wouldn't have happened. Um, You can't have football club owners getting involved in football decisions. It just doesn't work. Um, But then introduce me to a billionaire who doesn't think the great is everything, and it'll be the first one that you introduce me to. But then most of them are sensible enough who they own football clubs to know that you've got to leave the football to the football. I think that near-death experience last year, and let uh, let me be clear about this as well, it was a near-death experience. People were saying to me, it might be good for us to go down. We'd have gone down again, because I think we would have got hit by a penalty deduction, because the wage bill was such that you couldn't have cleared. You'd have had to have cleared out the whole squad, which basically Mm -hmm. means you're playing a UT in the (laughs) championship, so you get relegated anyway, or you get a massive points deduction like Derby did so we could have been in League One that was my worry for Everton because I thought oh. if Everton went down it wasn't I mean we f- we had an argument about this on our sports show but it would have been catastrophic for not for the city and for the, every person on a like it would have been for, for, Everton. for Everton Football Club its supporters and you write the city's economy it would have been a massive blow so I think you know listen you can't dress this up the business has been run appallingly badly 
I've got a problem on a personal level in terms of some of the stuff that goes on on social media and what inevitably comes out of this from supporters, which is, you know, the chief exec, the chairman, the, the, listen, you know, I know these people. So I don't know Bill Cowney particularly well. I do know Denise. I know some of the people who work in that executive team. And again, all I can say is you're never going to get anyone working harder. And that's all I'm going to say on that. You know, nobody's going to work as hard for effort as those guys do. Um, on the football side of it, you've just hoping now that the owner appreciates that it's not his skill set to decide who should be playing left wing, centre forward and centre half for Everton. And it's not his job to do favours for his mates who happen to be football agents. His job is to put Everton's interests first and foremost. And I think in Lampard, and again, I know mixed feelings about Frank, and apparently once he voted Tory, so, you know, let's all burn him. <laughs> um, for me, Frank Lampard will get the job done if he's given the opportunity to do it. And I think if he's stopped from doing it, I think he is principled enough to resign. And he doesn't need the money. Hmm. So he could. You know, he could walk away tomorrow, Frank, and he's, he's not, you know, he's not going to be worrying about how he pays his mortgage. I just don't think time exists in football. No. Like, now. Not like, the way it used to. Yeah, I mean, in terms But how of, long did Klopp get before yeah. he got yeah. a semblance of success? But I don't think... Far we, more than yeah. any Everton managers had yeah. over the last seven years. I just think the investment that goes in, especially when you talk about what you put into the team, the ground, that's obviously not hanging over the head, but it's coming up slowly or whatever. I just don't think there's time for them to go, right, have five years, build as a nice team, we might get your European mm. qualification. Then people... Because I, I fundamentally don't think they understand anything about football, mm. apart from how much money they've got and how yeah. much what players they can buy. They think, right, well, if we, if we put this money in, why can't we break the top five? Why can't we? It doesn't work like that. It doesn't. And I, and I think, you know, again, I think you can get carried away between social media and, and the, the majority of support. I think if the owner is strong, then the supporters will the vast majority of supporters will give Lampard I'm not saying five years but I think he'd mm. get three and I think the expectations for this season need to be managed if we finish 10th Lampard should be made manager of the year right. or should certainly be in the running in terms of the stadium Andy the stadium will be it will be built if you've been on site it's going gangbusters they're well ahead of schedule Lango Rock doing a fantastic job plug for one of our members there um, but the money's secured um, there's no issues around the financing of the stadium so the stadium is going to happen the importance to the city is huge because that will be the catalyst that helps to regenerate the north of the city but if you are landowners in and around that site then you're hoping for one of two things firstly we resolve all the issues we spoke about earlier with the city council and the controversies hanging over us or secondly Evan getting a new, a new owner with similar interests and ambitions as Manchester City's owners have for East Manchester. Because if you get that silver bullet, and I don't know whether the Americans have got that vision. I know Peter Kenyon is leading that consortium and obviously knows exactly what happened at Manchester because he was at United for a time. If they came in and said, yet yeah, we want the stadium, yet yeah, we want to invest in a football club, but also we want to regenerate North Liverpool, that would be the silver bullet for our mm. city. That would be so good in terms of news. And I'm not talking about what happens on the football field, no. but for our city, that would be a game changer economically. So mm. I hope we get new owners who have got that sort of ambition. But as I say, I've got zero uh, knowledge of whether the guys that Kenyon's involved in will be able to deliver that sort of uh, result. And on the football side, do you think last season was just you know, a blip or do you think he's will be okay now? Because one of my concerns we spoke about on the sportscast on a Friday is, you know, him being very savvy in the transfer market because the whole atmosphere that the fans built, which was great the last 10 games or so, you know, you really felt that the fans had an impact. I don't think you can continue that for 38 games. You no, know? you can't do that. You can't, I, I think it'd be very difficult for you to, to get that if we ended up in the same situation, same scenario. I think it'd be difficult for the supporters to get up like that again. Mm. Um, I actually am quite optimistic. I'm half glass, glass half full, sort of, as you can probably guess uh, fr from the discussion. So I think we'll be all right. As I say, I think we'd be daft if we don't think we're going to be hovering between that sort of 10th and 15th. And I'm okay with that. I think he's got to be given at least three transfer windows. I think Richarlison going 
listen, we've all got, you know, again, a bit of an emotional attachment to Richarlison. But I think there's positives in that because mm. I think you can reinvest the money. You can start developing the team a bit more around Calvert-Lewin's strengths as well because funny player at Charleston. He's neither one thing or another. He's not a winger. He's not a centre no. forward. And I think in Tottenham he'll do well, actually. I think he will. I think it'll be a really good signing for them. But I'm not quite sure that he fitted in terms of a style that Everton have got a squad to take advantage of at the moment. So I think that might help him getting out the way. Gives Lampard, I think, an opportunity of clearing the decks a bit, coming up with a strategy that looks a little bit more about, as I say, Calvert-Loon's strengths. And I think the other thing is that even though it looked as though we were an awful side towards the back end of the season, the squad isn't as bad. And I don't think we'll suffer as many injuries. I know everyone says injury. You were very unlucky, injury. Like. I mean, the spine of that team at one point went. I think mm. there was only pick for who stay fit out of the spine. So, I, I, as I say, I'm not expecting us to be pulling up any trees. Um, but I do expect us to be comfortable mid-table. Mm. And I think Lampard can deliver that. The supporters have got to stay patient. And I will just remind Evertonians, you know, how many managers have you hounded out over that seven-year period? And if you keep doing the same thing, you keep getting the same results, you can't complain. Mm. I thought Benitez was a bad appointment for all the reasons that have been well rehearsed. He was never going to be allowed to have a bad run. And he knew that as well as anyone else, because not a stupid man. Why the owners didn't is beyond me. Um, and listen, you could have ended up with somebody, that Pierre guy or someone. Yeah, we someone definitely great. could have ended up relegated yeah. last season. So as I say, remember how you felt about Frank Lampard after the Crystal Palace game and maintain that feeling for at least the next two and a half seasons yeah. and if you don't like what he's doing then fine start having a whinge and a moan on Twitter we're going to have some bad results it's going to be challenging Liverpool are going to continue to be successful which always makes an Everton manager's job harder but it doesn't matter what Liverpool's you know I, again I think one of the cultural problems that Everton has is its obsession with Liverpool totally do yeah. I don't get it I mean, I, I honestly, until the last game of the season, once we were safe, I was interested in the title. Mm. Oh. And that was it. And I watched that, and it was, what a great last day. You know, as an Evertonian, I was relieved to be able to watch the Burnley and Leeds game with me slippers on. Um, but I was watching the City and Liverpool, and it was just a fantastic last day. But before then, why am I asked? Mm. Because if we get relegated and you win nothing, what consolation is that to me? Yeah. Just ridiculous. So again, I think as a club, mm. you know, and I, and I think this does come from the top, by the way, we've got to forget what Liverpool have done or are doing and just manage our own business. Mm. You know, I've never been, I never ever worry about competition in our space. No, I shouldn't. It's... Say, well, downtown does it this way. And people say, oh, so-and-so would never do that. And say, well, that's fine. Yeah. That's that's up to them. But that's the way we're doing it. It's like walking outside your business and looking down, like the, for example, on the corridor and just going, oh, they look like they're busy. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's Ridiculous. just counterproductive, isn't it? Absolutely crackers. So, you know, forget the obsession with Liverpool. Give Lampard time. Hopefully get owners in who've got big ambitions for the city as well as the club. And I think the next 10 years could be good for Everton. But it's not going to be a quick fix. No. Oh, and you just mentioned their mate downtown. How can people get involved? Do they want to kind of, you know, expand the business? Do they want to get involved? I mean... Yeah, well, we're, we're nationwide now. So we're in nine cities, probably 10 by the end of the, the year. Um, and you just just go to the website all the w's downtown and business dot com tell you how to get involved if you're a small business um sort of you know just starting up one or two people um probably not for you because it's high level decision makers in small medium big enterprises um but it doesn't mean if you've not got millions of staff you can't join we've got a tech company of members who've got eight members of staff and and through our connections they did a deal a few weeks ago for a couple of million quid so i'm not saying size you but i don't want to take money off people who are not going to get anything out of the network so new startups tend to not work for us there's likes of the chambers of commerce and institute of directors people like that that's probably a better place to start or bni um, but if you're established you're high growth you've got money to invest in getting out and about raising your profile, getting across the country, 
we're absolutely the right network for you. We've done about two billion pounds worth of deals over the last 20, wow. well, it's 20 years next year. Uh, we've got a great relationship with local authorities across the country, decision makers. As I say, we deal with chief executives, managing directors of the companies that we work with. So you're not having to spend your time talking to lots and lots of different people to get a decision as to whether they're interested in your product. Uh, but you've got to be at a certain level to join. I wouldn't mm. waste anyone's time. And we'll tell you that very honestly as mm. well, by the way. We would never, as I say, one thing I would never do, because I've been there myself as a business owner, is take money off you when you know, well, actually, you're not going to get anything back from this. Mm. Uh, but get in we're, touch. We're, we're, we're have a chat. as well, mate, and Chris and stuff. It's a great team you've got there, so I know yourself, uh, know myself that, you know, it's definitely um, worth taking a look. Mate, it's probably one of the only times I spoke politics and actually, like, listened and enjoyed it properly and all that because sometimes I think again like we spoke about sometimes you can just get so frustrated and angry with it, what's going on but it's been um, great to get your insight in mate and I half kind of want to say to you go back in and try and sort <laughs> it out but I won't uh, you like me too much that. for that do yeah. you but um, anything else from you George no really enjoyed it thanks for your time mate thank really you good. no it's been great thanks really thanks, enjoyed right. it myself thanks nice one everyone see you next week <laughs>